My name is Nathan Newfang. I'm one of the pastors here at Hebron. And uh, we're excited that you have joined us here uh, for the second time as we walk through John chapter 15 together. So Mitchell has already said the importance of of where we're going to be at today. And and I want us to, real briefly, before we get to John 15, I want us to go to John chapter 20 and look at the end of his book where John gives us basically the purpose statement for his book. He says this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written about in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And so John ends his book trying to say everything else that you read about in this book is so that you may believe. And so as we walk through these Passion Week teachings, these aren't just to give you something so that you can look at and say, man, I learned something new. Our prayer is always that the information leads to a transformation in your life. So that you take the truths of John chapter 15 and you say, I want to apply that to my own life. And so we're walking through John 14, 15, 16, and 17. And these these are the last teachings as uh, they they are leading up to Christ going to the cross for our sin. And so these are his last words to his disciples, those that he's been walking with. And so it's really important that we take note of what John is trying to say here, what he's written here. Because these is really, this is really the bulk of what Jesus is trying to teach us. He's trying to tell us. And so there's three major relationships that we see all throughout 14, 15, 16, and 17. And I want to go over those. The, the first relationship that you're going to see throughout all these teachings is the relationship between you and Jesus. And so it's obviously very important as we walk through these things, especially today in chapter 15, when Jesus over and over again says, abide in me, remain in me, obey my commands. All these things he's talking about because it indicates if we have a relationship with Christ. Uh, The second person, people that we should have uh, interaction with and that our relationship with Christ will affect is our relationship with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And so these are other believers. And we're going to see at the end of this passage today that if we do remain in Christ, if we have a relationship with Christ, it's going to translate to the way that we interact with one another and we interact with believers. And the third thing that we're going to see, the third relationship that we see in this passage of Scripture is your relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so we see this in 14. Uh, We see it today in 15. Uh, We see it more in 16. And Landon will cover more in detail tomorrow what that looks like. Uh, But we will see that if we are in Christ, then we have the Holy Spirit that resides inside of us and therefore have a relationship with him. And so he enables us to be able to do a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, There's a few metaphors that we see throughout John chapter 15, uh, things like abiding in Christ and producing much fruit. And so before we we get to the bulk of this, I do want to explain those two things. What is this fruit uh, that he is talking about here in John chapter 15? Well, we see that fruit is the outward expression of an inward change in your life. And so it's the actions and the words that flow from our hearts because of what Jesus has done for us. It's these actions and these things that we say and these thoughts that we have that, that glorify God as our life looks more like the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so he says over and over again, even in the Gospels, he says, out of your mouth flows what's in your heart. And so just as it eventually Whatever's inside of you is going to come out. It's going to be fruitful in your life. And I know for us, in a lot of ways, uh, we see this also, this idea of abiding or remaining. And the the whole idea is that everything that we do, that we remain in Jesus, uh, that no matter what happens in our life, that we can hold on to him because ultimately he is the one that is holding on to us. So the first truth we see in this passage of Scripture today is this. From John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17, the Christian life is all about abiding in Christ. Uh, More than anything else, more than anything else, I want to bear witness to Christ. And I hope that your aim too. I hope that you want to bear fruit, good spiritual fruit for Jesus. And and we pray, and we pray that as you you learn about your relationship with Christ and you grow in your relationship with Christ, then you're more apt to be able to bear more spiritual fruit for Christ. John uses the word abide 40 times in this gospel alone and 27 more times in his epistles. And, And in the context of this passage, it seems to emphasize this ongoing faith and loving obedience to the Father and through the power of the Son, and the Spirit that results in this good fruit. And so let us look at this passage of Scripture today. The way we're going to do this is instead of reading the whole passage, we're going to read it in little chunks. 
Uh, and so we see here that the Christian life is all about embodying in Christ. And so let us look at verse 1. It says this, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So, so if you've read the Gospel of John, one of the things that you see throughout the Gospel is Jesus is trying to set apart who he is. He's trying to tell his disciples like, hey, in case you haven't uh, gotten it so far, he keeps using this phrase, I am. And it's pointing back to who God revealed himself to the Israelites in the Old Testament. He said, I am who I am when he was talking to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. And so we see here that he keeps saying these statements, I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the, you know, over and over again, he's saying these things throughout his gospel. And he gets to this point here where he says, I am the truth true vine. And so, so why would he say that? Well, in those days, in Jesus's time, there was a great golden vine that hung over the temple in Jerusalem. And so Josephus, a writer, described it this way. The gate opening into the building was, as I said, completely overlaid with gold and was the whole wall around it. It had, moreover, above it those golden vines, which depended grape clusters as tall as a man. And so after the Last Supper, Jesus most likely is walking with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he's walking there down the Kidron Valley, uh, he's going to pass the temple. And they're going to see this golden vine that is up in the temple. And so he points to it and he tells them, he says, hey, all throughout the Old Testament, Israel is depicted as a vine. We see this in Psalm chapter 80, Jeremiah chapter 6, Ezekiel chapter 17 and 19, Hosea chapter 10. Over and over again, we see this depiction of Israel as a vine. And, and so we get to the point, let me read you a passage from Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 through 7 says this. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill, and he dug it and cleared it of stones, and he planted with it choice vines. He had built a watchtower in the midst of it, and he hewed out a vine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there for me to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedges and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled upon. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up and I will command and I will command the clouds, and they will rain no more upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah, and his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. You see, what he's trying to say there is that throughout all of their history, they were supposed to be the vineyard, and they were supposed to produce good grapes. Uh, they were supposed to produce good fruit, good works. But against the Old Testament background, they had failed. Like Israel was not doing what God had called them to do. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, one of the things he says here is like, look, all these promises that the Israel was supposed to do were not fulfilled through him. He's saying, I am the true vine. That's why he says the word true there. It means, it means genuine or, or real. And he's saying, I'm the actual true vine that you're looking for. And then he says, the father is the vine dresser. And so he is the one that is ultimately responsible as he taught about uh, the mutual indwelling that we were supposed to be. And he says, the father is the one that stands to the side and oversees this whole entire vineyard. And, and it's really cool here because the father does two specific things in this passage. If you read this, it says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So we're going to come back to that one. But then he says, every branch that does bear fruit, he says he prunes. And so let's look at the pruning part because that part's most clear. And then we'll come back and look at the takes away part. So one of the things that we see in this passage of scripture is that the father will prune all branches that don't bear as much fruit as they could. And the reality of this passage of scripture is this. No fruit bearing branch is exempt from pruning. And so, so Christians who bear fruit, you're going to be pruned. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that we'll suffer. Or that we will be disciplined. 
It means that things won't always be painless for us. However, the Lord is good, and he uses all these things for our good so that we might bear more fruit. And the removal of things happens for our good. James 1, 2 says it this way, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. He says you should count that joy. And however, I'm reminded even today of what discipline means. As I've been at home, like a lot of you, I've had more time around my kiddos. And I don't know if it's just more time around them or the fact that we're in close quarters and we, we bump up against each other, but there seems to be friction. And there's times when we have to discipline our kids and say, buddy, that's, that's not the way that we should treat your brother. Or buddy, that's not the way you should treat your mama. And I find myself constantly trying to, to shepherd my kids and to, to discipline them for their good so they see when things aren't the way that they should be. How much more so for us as believers in Christ? As we are sinners, we'll bump into other sinners and things will happen in our lives. We need to be disciplined as well because I don't know about you, but I still don't look as much like Jesus as I want to. There's still times in my life when when the fruit of my life is not reflecting who Jesus is and what he's done for me. Instead, the fruit of my life reflects my flesh. It reflects my sin. It reflects the things in my life that that I need cut away so that I can look more like Jesus. Pruning will happen, but it's always beneficial because it's Jesus' way to help us to be more productive. It's God the Father as the, the vine dresser's way to make us look more like Christ. And so the second action that we see here, after he says we prunes, let's go back and pick that up. He says that he takes away or, or cuts away. The idea here is that he takes the, the dead wood away so that the living wood can continue to bear fruit. Now, it's difficult because what this is trying to point at, no matter which side of the, uh, no, no matter how you interpret this passage, we see here it's very transparent that the purpose of this verse is to show that no Christians, uh, that all Christians bear fruit, that you cannot be uh, a non-Christian and bear fruit. And if, you, if you're bearing fruit, then you, you're a believer. That, that's what, really what this is pointing to. And so we see all throughout the New Testament that there are people that are connected with Jesus, but they don't have their life changed. And so a perfect example of this would have been Judas Iscariot, who has already walked out. He's no longer walking with the disciples at this point. Uh, He had a relationship with Jesus in the sense that that he walked with him, but he wasn't changed by who Jesus was. He he wasn't a believer in Jesus is what we would say. And so because of that, he he had this connection, uh, this proximity with Jesus, but he really didn't have his life changed, uh, a regenerated heart. And now this verse is not saying that there are people that can fall away from Christ if they are believers. And we know this because several other times earlier on in the book of John, we see that Jesus has been very clear that whoever is a believer, that he holds on to those, that he will not let those people go. So look at John 6, 39 says, this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Or John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Or the passage in Romans 8, which, which Landon loves to talk about, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. And so you can't read this passage of scripture and say that these people are losing their salvation. That is inconsistent with the rest of scripture. But there are people that will probably bear fruit, uh, that, that looks like fruit for a period of time, but that aren't connected to Jesus. And, and what we see from this passage is if you are connected to the vine, if you're connected to Jesus, if you abide in him, your life will bear consistent spiritual fruit. You will look more like him tomorrow than you do today. You'll look more like him in a week than you do today because you're growing in this relationship with Christ. And so we, we, we see that it's very clear that nobody expects, uh, for instance, a baby to, to, to be born and then to start walking. Growth takes time. So for some of you, maybe you've gotten saved recently. And you're trying to figure out, like, man, my, my life doesn't look like I want it to yet. Or I see believers doing great things or they, they, they pray differently and, and I don't seem to, to have that relationship. What, what do I do about that? Well, it takes time. Uh, but, but the goal is that you're consistently remaining in Christ. You will be bearing spiritual fruit. Nobody expects growth to happen instantaneously. Growth takes time. But there should be fruit. And so that's the first couple verses that we see there. He goes on and he says, already, verse three, already you are chosen because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me 
and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And so he, he says that he prunes or he cleanses them through the word. And I love that picture there because Jesus is showing the importance of his word. He's saying, like, if you hear and respond to the teachings of Jesus, you're going to become more fruitful. I mean, this is why we push the Bible over and over again. This is why throughout every teaching time we have, every sermon that is preached, every teaching time on Wednesdays, every connect group, that we're pushing people towards this idea of biblical literacy. We, we want people to know the Bible because it's only through knowing the Bible that we can really experience who God is and what he has done for us. And this is why we push this. And he says the cleansing power of the word, Jesus has spoken to his disciples. It's the equivalent of the life that's going through the vine and, and to the branches. And I love it. it says there that you are clean, that you are clean. And the reason why I love it says that is because I had to get this picture of, of, a, of a farmer that's walking alongside and he sees this fruit there and he, he cleans it off knowing that it, it'll be good fruit that can be consumed. And our actions and our thoughts, they have to be washed in the words of Christ. And then verse 4, he goes through and he says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So in verse 3, he says the disciples bear fruit as they respond to these teachings. In verse 4, Jesus emphasized that just as a branch cannot bear grapes unless it remains in the vine, so too the disciples cannot bear fruit unless they remain in him. And so remaining in Jesus, if it's this metaphor, it's talking about this fellowship or, or loyalty to him. And then obedience to his commands is clearly important. And we'll get to that more as he, we go along in this passage of Scripture. But when he returns to the Father... Um, he did not leave them alone, and, and that's the beauty of it. He gives us his spirit to be able to walk us through this Christian life. And in the context, this fruit here is maintained uh, by this fellowship of, of keeping Jesus' word. Uh, when Jesus continues to fellowship with them through the spirit, they suggest that this fruit is the entire ministry that we are able to do. And no branch has life in and of itself. It's utterly dependent on the life and the fruitfulness of the vine to which it's attached. So the living branch is thus truly in the vine. Um, the life of the vine is truly in the branch. And so we're not that far from the Old Testament when, when he comes in and the, he promises, God does, that he will give us this new heart, uh, this new covenant, uh, this new presence of the Spirit that will be in his people and that will allow us to be able to obey. And he keeps going on and later on in verses 9 through 11. He talks about why obedience is so important. And then we get to verse 5. And he says, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch, and he withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. And so up until this point, Jesus has always already made it clear, but he's implied it, that the disciples are the branches. But then he gets to the point in verse 5 where he explicitly says, just in case you haven't gotten it yet, because sometimes the disciples like us can be a little hard-headed. He says, don't forget, uh, you are the branches. You are the one that need to be connected to the vine. And the ultimate alternatives are set out here, and it's like you either remain in the vine and you're a fruit-bearing branch, or you're thrown away and to be burned because you don't have a relationship with the vine. And some people may appear to bear fruit for a period of time. Uh, but what we see in this passage of Scripture is it becomes phony. It's, uh, it's, it's like plastic fruit. It won't work as well as it could. In verse 6, we see here that if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and it's thrown into the fire and being burned. And we see this even in our study in the book of Revelation, uh, that these are pictures of, of being cast out. And it's very clear there that they, they are, these, in verse 6, are not believers. Because um, the, the, the way that this is written, it indicates that God is the one who implements the judgment. If you have a decision at one point in time, but your life is not consistently showing Christ, then you might not be abiding in him. You might not, you not, might not, might not have a regenerate heart. I mean, there's a lot of people that make decisions for Christ and they walk on and they're, they, their life is the same. They, they don't, they're not actually changed by the Spirit. But what we see in this passage of Scripture is that if you are in uh, the vine, if you are remaining in Christ, that then your life will be changed. And it only comes through Jesus. There, there's no other person, no other work, no other way. 
And so if you're trusting in Christ, but you're trusting in something else as well, you're missing the whole point. It doesn't say abide in Christ and all these other things. This passage is very clear over and over again that we should do everything we can to abide in Christ. And then we get to verse 7. It says it here. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. And so I love this here because God indicates that he's the one who responds to the disciples' request. And these promises that he says there, if you abide in me, he says, my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. That's really important because he's saying you have to ask in his name. Now, it doesn't just mean that you just tag on in Jesus' name to the end of your prayer. Instead, it's upon uh, being in Christ of really understanding what he wants for us and in his teachings. You're abiding in those things. And as a result of those things, your requests are going to be honoring to God because you're asking for what Jesus wants. And so when your heart's desire matches God's heart's desire, that's when we see this idea of answered prayers. And this isn't the prosperity gospel, uh, but we do want to ask boldly in accordance to what God has given us and shown us through his word. Uh, but it doesn't mean for us that we could stand up and just say in Jesus' name and ask for, you know, a million dollars or a or Ferrari or, you know, you know uh, that uh, this whole virus thing could go away and just declare that it's the case because we said in Jesus' name. Like, that's not the way this works. What we see in this passage of Scripture is we are asking in accordance to what God has shown us, what his heart is. And, and so this is hard for some of us because we've prayed for really good things to happen, and, and it hasn't happened yet. Um, I've prayed for family members that aren't yet believers um, I've, I've prayed for that they will come to Christ. I've prayed for people that were sick and, and, and the Lord chosen his will and his sovereignty to, to take them home to him as opposed to leave them here with us. And those are hard things to deal with. And we, but we ask in accordance to his will and in accordance to his name. And ultimately, it builds trust in us as we trust God the Father that he knows what's best and that he knows what is best for us. In verse 8, we see there, uh, by this the Father is glorified. And this is really cool because even as our prayers are answered, we're, we're glorifying the Father. And as we remain and we bear fruit, we're proving to be his disciples. I love that in verse 8 there. He says, and so prove to be my disciples as the Father has loved me, in verse 9, so that I have loved you. Now, it's, it's incredible to me that he gets to this point And he says that as the Father has loved me, so the Son that has always been in fellowship with the Father, that has always shared this incredible community with one another, he says, in the same way that the Father loves me, I have loved you. We should let that sink into us. That today, even amongst times and issues when maybe we don't feel like it. I mean, maybe you're a believer in Christ today and you're 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 just feeling difficulty. And you're like, God, do you love me? Do you care for me? Can you understand what's going on right now? Take heart from verse nine. He says, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. That's the kind of love that's not gonna go away. That's the kind of love that's not gonna change because circumstances are different. This is the kind of love that the father has shown the son from eternity past. And he says, in the same way, the son loves you. He loves you. Jesus' statement is incredible there. And he uses it to say that I have love, depicting that his love is a completed action. It's as if he's saying, I know that I'm going to the cross, but I know I'm going to rise again, and I'm going to conquer death, and I'm going to conquer hell, and I'm going to conquer the grave, and I'm going to do all those things to prove to you my love for you. And so when he's asking us to abide, he's asking us to obey. He's asking us those things because of his love. And we're going to see that in even greater detail. Um, so we see this idea that when we abide, um, it leads to our obedience. And our abiding is shown through our obedience. And so there's a way for us as we abide in Christ, as we walk with him, it's shown that we, we see that our obedience, uh, it, it, that we should obey God. So if you see in verse 10, if we continue to go on there, it says, if you keep my commandments, uh, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And so he says here, remaining in the Father's love was not a passive thing for Jesus. 
It involved obedience to his commands. Uh, and these two verses, uh, they, don't, they don't set up this alternative of either you obey all the commands precisely or um, you're, you're, you're just in trouble, you're, you're going to hell. The thing that this is pointing to is that Jesus Christ obeyed all the commands when you and I would fail to obey those commands. And that's why it's so important that he starts with this whole idea of abiding, of abiding. And this is why we stress that abiding in Christ fulfills and completes uh, the, the law, uh, this, this idea of our obedience, that we should obey in these things. And it's important to remember the life of Christ. I mean, so often we get to Passion Week and we think about his death as we should, and we think about his resurrection as we should, but let us not forget that Jesus lived the life that you and I can never live. Um, that he fulfilled the law perfectly in a way that you and I fail to every single day. And because of his perfect life, he was able to be that perfect sacrifice for you and for me. And so when this comes to us there in verse 10, he says, I have kept all my father's commandments and, 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 and abide in his love. And so for us, it's pointing us to the point to where we should abide as well. And verse 11 is really comforting for me. Um, because he says, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And so I love this because in verse 11, uh, obedience is demanding, but obedience is also the pathway to true joy. See, the obedience that's mandated in 9 and 10 may seem gray and joyless, like, well, gosh, we just have to obey all these rules and that's difficult, but Jesus insists that his obedience to the Father is grounds for his joy. And he promised that those who obey him will share in this same joy. And so what is mentioned here is that uh, if you are not in Christ, you can have happiness for a period of time. And you can have what you think is joy, uh, but when your circumstances change, your, your feelings may change. And, and we, even as believers, may, may feel that temptation at times. But what we see here is that if we are in Christ and we're remaining in Christ, we can experience not just joy, but true joy. Real joy, not a joy that's going to be fading, not a joy that's going to just go away, but a joy that will remain and that will last. And so if we don't have joy, we have to ask ourselves if we have Christ. Because if we have Christ, we will have joy. And so you can, are the only one that can evaluate that in your life. But as you're sitting with people that you may be quarantined with, you may ask them the question, well, do, do I exhibit joy? Because for a lot of us right now, it's really easy for us to think about our circumstances and to be down about it. But Jesus says that if you understand who I am, if you, if you understand what I've done, if you abide and remain in me, and you, you're following in that obedience, that it should lead to joy. So we see that this abiding leads to obedience. This obedience leads to, uh, to love. And so our, our obedience is driven by his love. If you look at John chapter 15, Verse 12, he says this, This is my commandment, uh, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And so the model for the disciples' love for one another is Jesus' love for them. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, that's, that's, a, high, uh, that's a high, pretty high stakes. I'm like, Jesus, you want me to love others as, as you've loved me? I'm probably going to fail at that today in a lot of ways because I don't love people all the time like Jesus has loved me perfectly. But he says that if you remain in me and you obey, then it's going to lead you to lead to love others as well. So genuine love for God means that you have genuine love for his son. And, and, and I love this because fruit is not useful to itself. It's always beneficial for others. And so it's a blessing to others when we're living a life of obedience. Not only do we have joy, but we're able to, to love others well. And we can lay down our lives for our friends as he said that he's about to. And, and love as Christ loved is a big deal. And that's why Paul says in Ephesians that husbands are to love their wives and, and that we should do that by, by laying down our lives. But we should also do that, according to this verse, for others, for one another. And so do we do this? Like, what does this look like this week? Like, have you shared the good news with somebody? Uh, does somebody need an invite to, to watch a service or to watch a teaching time? Uh, does someone need a phone call or a text message or a conversation or, or hit up on social media just to say, hey, I'm thinking about you. I care for you. I mean, who needs a note in their mailbox? I mean, quarantine life doesn't mean that you can't love your neighbors well. 
And this passage of Scripture doesn't give us a choice. It doesn't say if you're quarantined, you can't love one another, uh, so you get a pass, but once it's over, then you got to do it. It says, no, this is my commitment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then he says this, greater love is no one than this than someone that lays down his life for his friends. And so in the ancient world, friendship was important, and it operated at a number of different levels. There's political friendships, uh, friends of the king. Uh, there's this benefactor client friendships in which a wealthy person would become a patron of someone who is less well off. Um, and then there's mutual friendship among equals. But in verse 14, we see that Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And so Abraham and Moses were described as friends of God in the Old Testament. And Jesus spoke of his disciples in the same way. But he also pointed out that the friendship was conditional. If you do what I command. So this obedience is not what makes them friends, but it characterizes them as friends. Whereas servants or slaves are simply told what to do, Jesus gets to the point and he says, no, 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 you're not that anymore. You're my friends. In fact, in verse 15, he says, no longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. And so he says, I've called you friends. It's the, the idea of this permanent new state, that, that all of a sudden you're no longer slaves, you're no longer just servants. No, 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 now you are, you are friends. And, and slaves are expected to obey the master, and he doesn't have to give any explanation for it. But friends of Jesus, according to this text, are viewed as completely different. Uh, they are objects of divine revelation because Jesus has communicated to them everything that I have learned from my father. Jesus called his disciples his friends because he let them know everything that he had learned from the father. But which he probably meant all that the father had commanded him to say is what he says in chapter 12. And so we get to this point to where he says, uh, now you, your friends are something new about you. And then he gets to verse 16 and he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide or remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. These things I command to you so that you will love one another. It underlines the fact that the friendship between Jesus and his disciples was not a result of the disciples' choice. He says it clearly. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I can't help but think about um, even like playing kickball when we were in elementary school. And like you would choose teams back and forth and how excited that, that you were or that I was whenever I got chosen to be a part of a team. Because, because being chosen is a big deal, you know. If you remember the first time that maybe you asked out your spouse and you asked them on a date. Or the first time that you found out that your spouse maybe liked you. And so there, or maybe your girlfriend or boyfriend, you, you finally got a promposal or whatever. You know, you got a chance to do that. You were excited about those things and the importance that it is of being chosen. And when Jesus says here, he says, I initiate all this. You see, before we were enemies of God, and yet Jesus still went to the cross and died on behalf of his enemies. So you'll be wondering then, well, am I chosen? And the good thing is, is John writes an entire letter in 1 John where he talks about how to know if you are chosen. But this is a question that we have. But if you've repented of your sin and you believe in Christ, then, then you're chosen. And he clarifies it. He says, not only are you chosen, but you're chosen to do something. Like you are chosen to bear fruit. And so in the early part of the pa passage, it says that the function of the branches is to bear fruit for the gardener. And we see that we are chosen to be able to do that. And it's the idea that as we go. So when Jesus said the disciples were to go and bear fruit, the going most likely referred to their missionary endeavors. Uh, that they're going to be doing something with this. So it's not just bearing fruit even uh, when we're at home by ourselves quarantined or when we run out to the store. But as we go, as, as, as we end up going in, you know, whenever time we get to, to, to other nations, to other places, as we go, we should be bearing this spiritual fruit. And, and that's what the, cho the choosing is representative. And then we get to verse 17. He says, these things I command to you so that you will love one another. The means by which the disciples remain in Jesus, remain in fellowship with him, is through obedience. And so it is something that's important for us, but it's crucial for us to understand again that obedience doesn't save us. It doesn't save us, but what it does is it shows that Jesus has made a difference in our life. And so we see here that this idea that, that love, it, it leads us to obey, which shows that we abide. And so love leads us to obey. So if we love God, it leads us to obey God. And we obey God, we are showing that we are abiding in God. 
And so as we wrap up this teaching time from John chapter 15, there's a couple application points that would be helpful just to kind of, as you're, as you're thinking through these, and, and I'll post these afterwards either in the, the Facebook thing or we'll make sure to get this out to you. Um, are you daily abiding in Christ? Like every single day, are you remaining in Christ? It's great when you can remember what Jesus has done for you. When you remember that time when Jesus and the gospel became real to you, that's awesome. But my question is, like daily, are you still abiding in Christ? Do you remain in him? Are you remaining in his teachings and what he has done for you? Are you joyfully obeying God's commands or is it drudgery for you? Like all throughout the scriptures, Christ commands us to do things. God commands us to do things. And are we obeying those with joy? Understanding that those things are, are aiding our relationship. They're, they're, they're evidences that we are abiding in Christ. Or is it something that we do because we feel like we have to? Is it drudgery? Um, are you bearing spiritual fruit? Are there things in your life that look different now than they did when you first got saved? Are you bearing more spiritual fruit? Are there, are, is, is Galatians, what it says in Galatians 5, is that indicative of your life? Do you have love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Are these things evident in your life? And if you don't know, ask the people that are with you all the time. Say, does my life reflect joy? Does my life reflect peace? Does my life reflect self-control? And the reality of it is, is that we should be bearing more spiritual fruit as we go along. And the fourth and final application question is, does your life show the love that God has expressed towards you? The fact that the Father... And the Son love us so much that he sent his Son to die on your behalf and on my behalf and raise again to conquer sin, shame, hell, the grave. He did that for us. Does your life reflect that? Remaining in Christ, abiding in Christ, means that ultimately that that we will reflect um, who God is and what he's done for us. And so that's to change everything about how we act, how we interact with one another. And I know for a fact that it's changed my life, but I pray that tomorrow that I look more like Jesus than even I do today. So let me pray for us, and then we'll close this time out. Uh, Father, we thank you for this day. God, we are grateful for who you are and what you have done for us. We are grateful that you have given us this word, um, that you talk about the importance of abiding, of remaining in you. And Lord, our prayer is that as we do those things, as we abide and as we remain, as we obey, um, that ultimately it is showing that we love, that we love you well because you have loved us so well. Thank you for choosing us to be here at this time in this place. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to go with your gospel to the ends of the earth, knowing that your gospel will spread. And that one day, as we've already learned about in Revelation, that many tribes and tongues and nations will be around the throne, exclaiming the goodness and the holiness of our God. God, we love you. And we are so thankful for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.